Welcome, ladles and jelly spoons, to King's Bishop Teaches Chess. I'm Coach Daniel, your host, also known as King's Bishop, here at chess.com. And I've been teaching chess to beginners and intermediate players since 1984, helping them to achieve a greater proficiency both in chess and in life. That is because there are many principles of chess that can be developed to enhance certain life skills. And so, in short, as you learn to be a better chess player, you actually learn to be a better human being. And we're glad of that. Well, one of the means by which we help our students to improve is by evaluating their games with them, identifying mistakes and thinking deficiencies, and helping them to make appropriate corrections. So, in other words, a chess coach's job is pretty negative at times because you have to constantly say what was wrong with what a player did. It's always a delight when I can feature a game of one of my students where there was very little wrong. And that's what we're going to do today. The purpose of this video is still to learn from the game that was played, but also to encourage this particular student, as well as his parents, uh, to demonstrate what great progress he has made. My student is Anshul. Uh, you can see his user ID name there at the bottom of the screen. And this was a game he recently played. And I'm going to show it to you today with commentary and um, see what we can learn from this game. So let's get right into it. Pawn to e4. And of course, we've taught Anshul that in the beginning of the game, he wants to control the center. He wants to get his pieces developed toward the center. And he wants to get his king castled safely behind his pawn shield. And so that's a very good opening move. Bobby Fischer is famously quoted as having said, Pawn to king four, best by test. Pawn to c5 is the Sicilian defense. And this is one of the major answers to this pawn to e4 move. The one we like the beginners to play is also to the center, pawn to e5. But this move has definite merit because um, he's still attacking the center, but he's doing so from the side. And in this particular defense, he's depriving white of a central target when the knight develops. And so it, um, it's a unique way to go about the opening, and it creates an imbalance right from the get-go. The benefit of the Sicilian defense is that it creates imbalance in the game immediately, um, and that it gives black some good chances to attack. Um, there are some drawbacks, I should say, before moving on to the Sicilian defense. First of all is that white has many ways to meet this defense. Secondly, in the main variation, white gets plenty of attacking chances of his own. And thirdly, because it's such a popular defense, there is a ton of opening theory to know if you're going to play the Sicilian defense. Now, Ancho goes with d4, a very interesting move, not the most common reply. The most common reply is um, knight to f3, and the main line goes d6, and then d4. And after captures, captures, um, he can bring out his c knight, but more often he brings out his king's knight to f6, something like this. 
and then the, the other night. And so not the most common approach to the Sicilian defense, but this particular approach is uh, known as the Smith-Mora Gambit, named after uh, Pierre Mora from France, who lived from 1900 to 1969, and also Ken Smith from the United States. He was a member of the Dallas Chess Club, and he lived from 1930 to 1999. The idea of the Smith-Mora Gambit is to sacrifice a pawn to get rapid development and to create attacking chances. Um, White's plan is pretty straightforward. He's going to place this bishop here on c4, and he's going to attack the soft f7 square. And meanwhile, he wants to get his rooks to the center, controlling, um, oops, I drew that a bit too far, controlling the c and the d files with his rooks. And uh, that's the way, that's his basic plan. The, he's taking advantage of the fact that black um, has difficulty finding a suitable place for his queen. And um, yeah, we, uh, we go from there. All right, so pawn takes pawn. And queen takes pawn. Now, the most common approach in this particular opening is to give away the c-pawn as well and then recapture with development. Knight takes pawn, knight to c6, knight to f3, pawn to d6, bishop to c4, pawn to e6, kingside castle, knight to f6, queen to e2, bishop to e7, rook to d1, as mentioned in the um, description of the smith mora gambit. After e5, h3 prevents any encroachment on g4. Kingside castle, bishop e3, bishop e6. And now he's ready to swing his rook to c1, as mentioned. Um, and you can see white is staged and ready to go. <clears throat> I'm sure Anshul didn't know this opening, and uh, it's likely that Anshul did not play d4 with the idea of playing the smith Mora gambit, but rather with the idea of simply controlling the center. And so he played queen takes d4. Knight to c6 hits the queen, which compels it to go right back to its home square. e5. Knight f3, knight f6, and knight c3. And actually, here we transpose to the retreat variation of the Lasker Pelican defense. Um, it's not normally reached with this uh, move order. Instead, let's go back. I'll show you. Normally after e4, c5, um, knight f3, knight c6, and d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4, knight f6, knight c3, e5, and then knight f3. This e5 is the Lasker Pelican variation, and Knight of Three is the retreat variation of that line. And so you can see you have the same tabia or the same um, positional arrangement, but uh, it, it, was, um, it was achieved with a different move order. Okay. So that's where we are in this particular game. 
and um, <clears throat> from there, bishop to b4. By the way, you can find the Lasker Pelican variation in the Encyclopedia of Chess Openings in volume B, section number 21. All right, so bishop to b4, pinning the knight to the king. And pawn to a3. Now at the master level, bishop to c4 is the most frequently played move in this position. And the most common line from there is to kingside castle, kingside castle. Trade the bishop for the knight. Pawn takes bishop. Knight takes the pawn on e4. And then white will either play rook to e1 or bishop to a3, hitting this rook up here. But um, coming back to what was actually played, we understand his desire to put the question to the bishop that is pinning his knight. He did take the knight, and pawn takes the bishop, and he played, um, Hoida played d5. He should have taken this pawn. It's undefended. And so that would have uh, basically been a free pawn for the opponent. And it also attacks another pawn. So a bit of a missed opportunity by black. d5 was played. And bishop b5, creating a pin on this knight. The problem is it gives black a second chance to capture this pawn. And so he would have been better to capture this pawn first before he could capture him. Because if he captures you, you're under attack, or he can even capture with the knight. So we need to always remember to ask, what is my opponent's threat? And what's the purpose of his most recent move? What's, where is he going next? And when we ask that question and recognize that it puts heat on this undefended pawn, the easiest way to resolve that is to simply capture. And if he takes it with the queen, we trade queens. C4 drives the knight back. And this is an equal position. Well, bishop b5 is the move that was played. And black declines his second opportunity to win this pawn. And really, it would have been best to capture with the knight. And again, threatening this undefended pawn on c3. And if the knight were to get there, that would fork the queen and the bishop. And so he'd have to play something like c4 to defend the bishop. And if he attacks the bishop, trade it off. And after check, you block with your bishop. And actually, black has a slight advantage in this position. Let's go back. So bishop to g4, this time he did play pawn takes pawn. And that's a good move. It, the, the knight is pinned, and you want to add an attacker to a pinned piece. So that's a very good move. Uh, knight takes the pawn, removing that attack. Bishop takes knight, check. This is a very good move. Is notice it gives black an isolated pawn. White is strapped with several isolated pawns. An isolated pawn is a pawn that has no friendly pawns on an adjacent file. They're isolated from their other pawns. So that uh, helps Anshul equalize the position after having made a slight... Um, mistake there in the beginning, that was a very good way to equalize.
h3 attacks the bishop he retreats and Anshul castles and of course it is good to castle we drill this into the students over and over and over again get your king castled however in this example because Anshul has initiative he can defer castling for a moment or two and notice that g4 is a very active move attacking this bishop and breaking the pin on his knight this knight is still pinned to the queen and so by castling he leaves that pin in place he does make his king much safer but uh, it would have been very good to break the pin attack the bishop and then after the bishop uh, moves then perhaps castle um, or see if you still have any other initiative like hitting this one or attacking that one there's a lot of, of options <clears throat> kingside castle is not a mistake i want to be sure you were clear on this but um, sometimes if you don't take advantage of your initiative it evaporates very quickly and you don't have an opportunity later to do so so pawn to e4 and uh, this is black now applying the principle of adding an attacker to the pinned piece when you have a piece that's pinned you attack it again that's a principle you're going to want to keep reminding yourself of add another attacker to the pinned piece Anshu plays a clever counter pin he's saying no you cannot take my knight because it's illegal now you cannot move into check and so this was a beautiful counter pin we give this move an exclamation point in our annotations preventing pawn takes knight very well done kingside castle now breaks the pin however since the pawn is unprotected he can simply take it and he does take it knight takes pawn is a nice try by black because it creates a fork against the queen and the rook but Anshul finds another beautiful tactic known as Zwischensuk. Zwischensuk is a German expression. Zwischen means between. Another word for this is intermezzo, or simply in English, in between move. Bam! Exclamation point. What a move. It's the perfect way to get out of the fork. And of course, black is not going to capture the rook when he's lost his queen. He has to recapture his material. And when he does, white can get his rook to safety. Another beautiful move by Anshul. What? Double question mark on the part of black here. This is a blunder. He needed to capture this queen with one of his rooks to uh, maintain equality but this allows white to retreat his queen to safety and what an interesting way to do it he didn't just put his queen on any safe square he put it on a square that attacks two different undefended pieces at the same time a very good move and this even though this um, can be defended it gains tempo because it forces him to take the time to defend it so in other words he gets an extra move out of this he played bishop g6 to defend the pawn running away and uh, uh not the pawn the knight running away and defending now i think he could have done better if he would have played bishop takes knight because that gets the bishop out of danger and defends the knight and in order to maintain your edge materially you'd have to take and that would leave white with a just a horrific pawn structure here in front of his king 
these ponds are isolated, these ponds are doubled and isolated, this pond is isolated, and that pond is isolated. But he did not. He played bishop g6 to defend his knight. And knight to g5. Super attacking the knight on e4. And now that he's ahead in material, his strategy is simply to convert the advantage by simplification. And what that means is he just wants to trade pieces down um, until his material advantage will be sufficient and his opponent won't have any attacking pieces left. So it's an excellent move creating a super attack on the knight. However, in this particular situation, he had an even better move. And we've taught a lesson here before called good, better, best. When you find a good move, look for a better move and see if you have greater opportunity. And so what was that better move? Well, if he would have played knight to e5, notice the undefended pawn here. And by the way, when you're thinking of moves, you always want to take note of the king the queen, and anything that's unprotected like this pawn because they're good targets to aim at. And so this move attacks this pawn but also attacks the bishop. And you'd say, well, taking the bishop is no big deal because that's an equal trade. Well, not exactly. Notice the bishop is defending the knight. If we can take the bishop and he takes our knight, his knight is now undefended, and we can capture the knight. That's called removing the defender. It's a very valuable tactic. So he would have had to play rook f8, uh, rook f to e8, to defend his knight. If he tries to do something silly like save his pawn, um, he ends up losing the knight. Let's go ahead and put rook fc8 there and demonstrate. Knight takes bishop. Now this is undefended. There's your remove the defender. And after he takes your knight, bye-bye black knight. And white is just crushing his opponent. So a touch of a missed opportunity there. Nonetheless, he's so far ahead, this makes perfect sense to put the question to this knight on e4. It's not necessarily a mistake per se, but he did have a better move. So h6 is a blunder because it fails to recognize that his knight is under super attack and he only has one defender. Oops, sorry, one defender. <laughs> Well, as you know, if you have more attackers than your opponent has defenders, you can overpower. And so, therefore, this is a blunder. Black should have super defended this knight or tried to move the knight to safety or something. Uh, best would have just been to move the rook over, getting a second defender against the knight. But uh, he did not do that. He just gives his knight away, and Anshul doesn't waste any time capturing it. Now rook f to e8, knight to d6. A beautiful way to get out of danger by putting his opponent in danger. Well done. A check is given, king to h2, and rook to d8, well, that hits this, but it totally ignores the queen here on h4 that can just take the rook for free. And I think this was the only real mistake Anshul made. He played knight to b7. He did not see that he could take this, this rook absolutely for free. So a double question mark for putting his rook on an empty on an undefended square that was hot and a double question mark for Anshul for not capturing that rook. 
Rook to d7. Knight to c5. Hitting the rook. Rook to d5. Knight to d3. Hitting this rook. Bishop takes. Pawn takes. Rook takes pawn. Queen to a4. Hitting a pawn here. G5. Black should have doubled his rooks here and made a battery against this bishop. Two attackers, only one defender would give him an opportunity to overpower, although Anshul could capture a pawn and add a second defender. And if Black gives check, he can run away. Instead, Black played pawn to g5. White captured the c-pawn, h5, queen c8 check, king g7. And this looks pretty interesting because it attacks the rook. But it also overlooked a discovered attack he could have had. And that discovered attack, well, let's note the relationship between Black's Rook and White's Rook. They're on the same rank, and the Black Rook is undefended. If he just moves this out of the way somewhere, that would be an undefended Rook. The problem is, you can't just move it anywhere because... Your rook would get taken. Your rook is undefended. However, a lot of times a pin can be turned into a discovered attack if the pinned piece has an attack of his own that he can make. And in this example, bam, bishop b2 gives check and discovers the attack against the rook on e1. And after black gets out of check, white wins the rook. And from here, checkmate would be unstoppable. For example, if black plays rook b3 attacking the bishop, white can simply ignore this threat and play rook e7 check, forcing the king to the sixth rank. Queen g8 check, king f5. Queen h7 check, king f4. And... Rook to e4, the rook's defended by the queen, that gives check, and the pawns cut off the king from going anywhere else. Uh, that is checkmate. <laughs> so a missed um, discovered attack with queen to c2. Rook D to D1. Queen to C3 check. Now, again, the same discovered attack is available. Even though these rooks are defending each other now, white has two attackers aiming at this rook. So if we play the discovered attack, we can overpower D1. Again, after he gets out of check, rook takes rook. And if rook takes rook, queen takes rook. And once again, checkmate is unavoidable from here as well. For example, king f7, queen d7 check, king g6, queen e6, pinning and super attacking the f man. Pawn to h4, queen takes f6 check. King h5, queen g7, pawn to g4, pawn takes pawn, checkmate. The queen cuts off these other squares. Beautiful checkmate there. So Anshul really needs to work on his discovered attack tactics. But it's hard to um, criticize when he's playing so well. Queen c3 check, f6, bishop takes pawn. Pretty clever move. 
Because this pawn is pinned by the queen, he says, I'm going to take this pawn because I can't be taken, and now I'm super attacking the F pawn. I might have just played here so that I have a battery defense of this rook, so that if rook takes rook, bishop takes rook, and he wouldn't dare take here, but this is under attack. Nonetheless, bishop takes g5 is quite effective. Black did play rook takes rook, and, and frankly, he probably should have just tried rook to h1 check and seen what he might could do from there, but it's really lost for black from this point, in, no matter what he does. So rook takes rook, and now bishop takes f6 is not the right way to go about this. Here you want to use your queen to create what's known as a mating net. A mating net, if you can think of a fisherman's net, it surrounds all the fish and then draws them in. Well, think of the king as a school of fish and the queen's attacking lines as the edge of that net. By playing queen takes f6 instead, that creates this mating net. And king to g8 would have to be played after bishop h6. You're threatening the magic square checkmate. Rook h1 can throw in a check, but after king to g3, Rook takes a3 check, king to h4, rook a4 check, king takes h5, rook a5 check, king g6, and now black has no more meaningful checks and can only delay the inevitable by giving his rooks away. For example, rook a6, pinning the queen, but since it's unprotected, the queen would just capture, and after rook e1, buying himself one more delay move. Notice that the king is in a corridor here, so all we have to do is get our queen up here and its mate. So queen c8 check. All he can do is block and give away his last rook and then check mate. So the mating net is another important characteristic and tactic to learn about here. All right, bishop takes f6 was played, king to f7, queen takes a1. And I'm actually going to give this move a double exclamation point. Objectively, it's not the best move that could be played, but for all intents and purposes, it, I can think of no better way for a beginner to simplify and leave his opponent no weapons with which to fight back. And if you think about it, a queen is worth $9, and each rook is, all, all, is worth 5 so that's 10 for 9 That's definitely worth it. And black is just left with two lonely pawns, while white has a bishop and all these pawns. So double exclamation point, very astute, saying, I'm not going to take any chances that my opponent will be able to trick me and end up uh, turning the table. I'm just going to take all of his weapons off the board. So well done on that. And the game continued this way. King e8, pawn to f4, king to f7, pawn to f5, pawn to a6, pawn to f6, pawn to a5, pawn to g4, king to g6, pawn takes h5 check. And it was here that black finally resigned. Checkmate is unavoidable. If he plays king f7, white can just go h6, king g8, h7 check, and he's doomed. If he takes the pawn, he's doomed. Let's say he takes the pawn. Well, we just push the next pawn, and the bishop cuts off the dark squares, and the pawn cuts off the light square, so the king can't get in there to stop the pawn from promoting. So on the other hand, if he blocks this pawn, then we just promote. And after king e6, queen e8 check, king d5, queen e5 check, 
defended by the bishop. King c5, bring in another pawn for another queen. King b3, queen c3 check. King to um, a4, queen c4 check. King takes pawn, and now checkmate by promotion. What a move. In fact, if you want to get cheeky, underpromote that to a bishop. Turn that into a bishop instead. And that's still checkmate. That would even be more beautiful, because how often do you see two bishops on the same color square, number one? And number two, it's kind of a rub in the face that you underpromoted for checkmate. So a lovely looking checkmate. That is a pristine game by Anshul. I'm so proud of him for this game. I just I want you to see how good this game was. I ran it through um, a computer evaluation software. And he scored an accuracy of 90.06. And he found the best possible move 53.8% of the time. Now, what that means is this. The best move ratio is determined by how many times your move matched what the computer would have done divided by the number, total, number of possi um, the total number of moves that you played. So 53.8% is extremely good. The accuracy is a measure of um, the evaluation. If you see the bar up here between the names, that's an evaluation bar that's based on um, centipons. Now, what are centipons? I'm glad you asked. Uh, a cent a pawn is one one hundredth of a pawn. So you can see here, um, it's barely to the right of the central line. White has a 20, 30, 34 um, cent a pawn advantage, somewhere in there, 20 to 30 cent a pawn advantage, which is basically a quarter of a pawn in value, in point value. Well, what the computer does is it takes your cent upon score and compares it to the cent upon score of the best possible move. And then it subtracts those two numbers, and that difference is called your cent upon loss for that move. When you add up all of those differences and then divide by the number of moves, you get your accuracy. Now, let me show you an interesting graphic. I'm going to come back to my introductory screen and put up a graphic for you. You can see from this graphic, Anshul, I said, had an accuracy of 90.06, which means that... His, his, if he played like this all the time, he's playing like someone rated between 2,000 and 2,100. That is the typical accuracy we would expect from an expert level player. Now, the trick, of course, Anshul, is reproducing that score every single time you play. Um, here, these scores are the average scores of all of these um, typical players games. So a typical expert, <clears throat> if you take all of his accuracy scores and take the average, they're, they're going to score 88.73. So if we were to factor this particular game in with Anshul's other accuracy scores, of course, his lifetime average would be much lower. But for this one game, he played at the expert level, and I don't know about you, but as far as I'm concerned, he deserves a pat on the back and two thumbs up. Well done. All right, now, for those watching, if you'd like one of your games analyzed, you can email me. I do it as a 
premium service to people who donate to my channel. And if you'll donate um, some money to the channel, say $25, we will be glad to evaluate one of your games. If you're interested in that, or if you're interested in private lessons, find my email in the description below and contact me and we can go from there. Um, by the way, that suggested donation is subject to change depending on demand and my time constraints. So be sure you email me to contact me um, to get an absolute minimum donation required. All right, I hope this was a help to you. Until next time, have a great day and play some great chess. Bye now.